hello there, and thanks for joining us for another episode of Mid American Gardener. I'm your host, Tanisha Spain, and with me today are three of our veteran panelists here to take your questions and show off what they've got going on uh, at their house, what's growing at their house. So uh, for starters, let's have them introduce themselves and tell you a little bit more about their specialty and what they're into. So Kelly, we will start with you. Hello, everyone. My name is Kelly Alsop. I am a University of Illinois Extension horticulture educator based out of Bloomington. My specialty is integrated pest management, which means I like looking for bugs in your garden, but I like looking for the good ones and the bad ones. I am passionate about trees and I love growing my own food. There you go. Okay. That's it. That's it. That's pretty powerful in itself. All right, Jennifer. Hi, I'm Jen Nelson. I'm a horticulturalist. You can find me online at groundedandgrowing.com. Uh, my favorite things to talk about are just anything plants, really. But my favorite things are vegetables and houseplants. Uh, but I love helping people figure out uh, how to tackle the problems that they're seeing in their garden. And so I've never found a plant I didn't like talking about. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and last but not least, John. Hi, I'm John Bodenstein. I'm a Vermont County Master Gardener. And I guess I like a little bit of this, a little bit of that. I've gone into, uh, I'm, I'm a volunteer teacher at Schlarman High School, so I'm getting into their greenhouse a little bit. I know the other two have, grow, have, have all kinds of experience in greenhouse. And, and there's something new I'm starting is, and I think we're going to talk about this in just a few minutes, is straw bale gardening. Yeah, so we've kind of hinted at this for a couple of shows. There are a couple of topics, actually, I want to circle back to. It was this one, and what was the other one, Jennifer? Earth box? Earth boxes. Earth box, earth boxes. So we're going to get back to that. But we've got, like, the stars aligned, and we've got the three perfect people to talk about straw bale gardening. So, uh, John, give us a little intro, and then um, it's kind of neat, like I said, that we've got the folks on the line who um, can speak to this. So, um Show us what you've got and a little bit about what it is. Okay, well, I was I just was watching Kelly uh, and the and the uh, horticulturists uh, on the web, and they were talking about uh, straw bale gardening. And I've been interested in straw bale gardening for many many years. Actually, that really started not even with straw bale gardening. I think a lot of the other two may have heard of Ruth Stout. Uh, she used to do. Uh, gardening in her yard and and uh, she would just throw her potatoes uh, in and then throw some hay on top of it but that's one thing that we need to talk about is with straw bale it's not hay it's straw there's a difference between straw and hay uh, straw straw is basically it's just dead um, grain stalks from wheat barley oats something like that where hay is alfalfa and uh, clover and things that they actually feed the cows. The straw, they use that in the, in the barn yet, but it's more of a bedding. But for us um, that have limited space or our ground is, is not uh, what we want, um, straw bale gardening is an alternative. I know Kelly knows a lot more about this than I do, but uh, I just thought this was something that was so interesting that I've been hauling hay, or I've been hauling straw now to the to the school, and we're getting set up because the main thing, I guess, one of the biggest challenges is the 12 days prior to planting. And I think Kelly can talk into that a little bit. So Kelly, okay, first we can find a picture and, and show what one looks like, but. What is, what is this type of gardening? Is it new and um, what luck or success have you had with it? Um, like John said, I don't know if it's new because people have been like layering their potatoes in straw forever. I've never personally done that. I was just looking to grow some herbs and I didn't want to create a bed. I didn't want a big, huge container of soil. And I actually saw a picture of a program that Jennifer was working on where she had grown some peppers in a straw bale. And I said, I'm going to start that. So straw bale really essentially is kind of like growing your vegetables in a compost pile while it's composting. So you need to get that straw bale 
active. So what we call it, what um, Joe Carlston calls it, is cooking the bell. What you're doing is you're adding fertilizer and water during those 12 days. And that fertilizer and water is feeding that bacteria. And that bacteria and even fungi within the straw bell is starting to break that straw down. Now, after 12 days, you would think it would be hard to plant in a straw bell, but it's not. It is actually really malleable. And, um, you know, sometimes I, you know, did use a little bit of um, a, a, a shovel to get my hole within the straw bell. But I was really, really quite surprised how well it broke down within the 12 days. Mm -hmm. Now, that's according to temperature, too. Now, Joe has a specific um, uh, recipe that he follows. I never followed that specific recipe. I just did a combination of water and fertilizer and just made sure I had put um, three cups of fertilizer per bell throughout the 12 days. Mm -hmm. um, another thing is when I like I water one day and it was kind of like a gallon of water it took to soak the bell. And the next day I would do a liquid feed. Now you don't have to do the liquid feed. You can actually spread the granulars. Um, just in my own personal experience, I actually tried to do organic and I just don't think the organic was high enough in nitrogen to get it to start cooking. So I probably would double that time for organic fertilizer um, because it just never got up to the 160 degrees. Now I used a thermometer and popped it into the bale. And once it became 160 degrees, I knew it had cooked, but then I wanted it to lower. That way I could add seeds and add plants. Wow. So Jennifer, I'm going to have you pick it up from here. So we've got the method, we've got cooking. So you, after, when you reach the 160, then what do you do? You let it cool, I heard Kelly say, and then you actually put the seed in and just treat it like a garden? Yeah, my, my experience, we actually had our bale in a wagon. It was mm. supposed to be portable for the master gardeners to take to farmer's market and show people. Um, we just kind of used a shovel and just made it a little, kind of parted the straw and just stuck the whole root ball in. Um, I'm not sure if that was exactly how you're quote unquote, supposed to do it, but it's what worked for us. We had a really hard time with the cooking, the cooking part that Kelly's describing. Um, for I, looking back at it, it's been a while since I did it, but I think our location was particularly difficult. We were um, trying to do this on the edge of our parking lot. So we had a, in a wagon. And so we had so much reflected, reflected heat and we just couldn't keep that bale wet. Like we would, I mean, I was so kind of surprised. Kelly was saying only a gallon was able to saturate her bale. We would just like pour the hose on it and we just could not keep it, keep it saturated. And we thought, you know, well, all that straw is just like, like almost like a soda straw. So it's just pouring mm -hmm. right through and we were doing the fertilizer and everything. And I don't know, you would think that the heat would help cook it, help get all those microbes going, but I think it was too much of a good thing. And mm. I mean, we got it, we got it working and it wasn't the dramatic, wonderful thing that I've seen other people put together. Like when I saw Kelly's after she got it up and running, it looks so much better than what we did. But I think that just goes to show that even the most novel method is not going to Mm -hmm. gonna pan out if you don't have a good spot for it. And I, I just think really that spot that we had was not not ideal. It was just, there's a limit on life and you can't have 130 degrees reflecting off blacktop <laughs> nonstop. So can you do this with seeds or do you guys use nursery plants um, for any do, experience with seeds? You can do both. You can do either one. And for certain things, uh, Joel has said that he actually liked doing seeds better and others, you know, the, the, the like tomatoes and things like that. He actually liked um, plants. And the thing to do is you've got to get 
know what your vegetables want. Like if they are full sun, you're going to make sure that that male is going to be in full sun. And, and there's, he's got all kinds of different uh, layouts, whether you do one bale, two bales, 10 bales, 15 bales, 25 bales. You, you want to have it laid out so that the north side is where you have your tall plants. So, so the sun is still hitting that. Mm -hmm. And he says to run them north and south so that you can have a little bit better. One of the, you know, it's, it's kind of detailed. Um, you know, like just one little thing that I remember him talking about was use temperate, temperate water. Don't use cold water when you water your bale because it kind of sets the microbes back a little bit when you oh, soak okay. them. So, you know, so we're going to have a, a large 55 gallon barrel of water that will be room temperature or that we're going to water with every day for those 12 days to get the microbes to do a little bit better. But one of the other books is container vegetables. So if you can grow it in a veg in a container, you can probably grow it in a bale. So, but then, you know, he's got, there's a lot of standards. How many, how many tomatoes can you put in the bale? How many That's peppers? what I was going to ask. How many do do, still, do so the planting got, distances still apply if you're correct. in a bale? It does. And maybe even a little bit more. Um, because, and then you've got to make sure that you're watering. Uh, a, a soaker hose is almost a necessity when you're doing that because like uh, Jennifer said, you know, she had a hard time keeping that bale moist just to get it treated. Well, once you have your plants in there, you can't have uh, your tomatoes going dry. You're going to end up with blossom end rot. So it's very important that you use a soaker hose rather than an overhead because that's the last thing you want to do is be getting water on your leaves. And it's the mm -hmm. same thing that you do in your regular garden, only maybe amplified a little bit the problems in the straw bale gardening. So yeah. it, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's something I'm going to enjoy. The kids are really excited about it. They're they're uh, picking out their plants. We've got seeds started. Uh, they're, they're picking out, I ordered, that was one of my other show and tells I'll, I'll get on later, but they wanted specialty things. And mm -hmm. so we, there, there's nothing really that you can't plant in a bale that you can plant in your regular garden. And I know Kelly did flowers, she did vegetables. You can plant, as some people have had more difficult planting on the side so that you don't have a, uh, a, a, a bad looking bale, mm -hmm. you know, a straw bale sitting in the middle of the yard. Uh, people have put them in containers, but drainage is another thing. You've got to make sure that uh, you've got it on a good draining area and uh, a weed barrier underneath so that, you know, we're going to do ours on concrete, uh, but we're going to put them up on pallets with um, a metal, a wire cloth. That's a good idea. So that the bales or the bales don't fall through and, and disintegrate. Mm -hmm. So there, there's all kinds of little things that, that but this book is, is I, I think anybody that is interested in doing it, uh, you don't have to follow it exactly, but uh, Joel, Joel Garskin is really, he's, the, he's talked all over the United States, all over the world, really. And- uh, Thank you. Um, all right, so Kelly and Jen, I was gonna ask where can people, and, and I'll put some links on our Facebook as well, um, but where can people learn more about this? Kelly, I know you gave a talk recently. Um, where can folks learn more? Yes, uh, I do have a YouTube video out there, University of mm -hmm. Illinois Extension Horticulture, and I've written about it several times, but um, before, uh, before we let you go and get off of this subject, I just wanna say that um, what is the benefit of straw bell gardening? No weeding, you guys, no weeding. That's the benefit of straw bell gardening. And if you love weeding, don't straw bell garden because <laughs> it, it is amazing. And plus not to mention, you get four more weeks of your growing season by doing a straw bell garden. A, a straw bell is cheaper than a bag of good quality soil. So this is really has a lot of benefits and a, uh, I've not had the challenge of water. Um, I've found that some my my straw bells keep really saturated. So I, I do think it is lo location might have something to do with that. So yep, 
go to my blog, Flowers, Fruits, and Frass. I've written about it, and I have a YouTube video. Okay. It might Jennifer? be the quality of the bale, too, because you want to, uh, when you pick up your bales, you want them to feel fairly heavy. You don't want a loose, uh, a loose bale where there's pieces missing because mm -hmm. you don't want it to fall apart. And if you do break a string, um, make sure you repair it right away as tightly as you can or, or just discard it and start over with a new bale. Okay. Jennifer, do you have any content out there? Um, I haven't written anything personally yet, but um, the book that John was referring to is really good. And I would just add, if people are wanting to do this this spring to get on obtaining that straw bale ASAP, I have noticed they can be hard to find. Um, a lot yeah. of garden centers sell out of them. Um, if that's the case near you, you might talk to people that have livestock. Sometimes they have straw um, that they'll uh, part with. Um, mm -hmm. Depending on the year, sometimes it's harder to get than others, but definitely make that decision and go forward as soon as possible. Awesome. I think I might give it a shot this year. I'm going to check out some more content and learn a lot more. Um, but yeah, when I saw the photos, and we're going to share some of those as well, um, it just looked really neat. And you can get so many things, you know, the space saving aspect of it was pretty nice as well. So awesome. We're going to put I'm sure we'll touch more on that. We're going to put ours on pallets too, so that they're up off this bent a little bit. And like I said, we're going to put that metal cloth so that it doesn't fall through. And, and mm -hmm. hope, we're hoping that it gives it a little bit of mobility. The main thing is you want to locate your bales before you start wetting them, where you're going to keep them because it's once they're wet, they are very difficult and heavy to move. Mm -hmm. Right now, when they're when they're dry, they're easy. They're they're maybe 20 pounds. I don't know something like that. 20, 25 pounds, but once they're wet, they can be very, very heavy. So depending on what you're planning, make sure that you have them where you want them and they're gonna stay there. And once you're done, you can put the, and once they fall apart, you can put the bales in, in your compost pile because it's really good. It'd be mm -hmm. half composted already, but it's good. We always need brown matter in the middle of summer, so. Mm -hmm. Awesome, thank you guys. That was great, great discussion. And we're gonna keep, uh, keep on those because I know a lot of people are going to be interested. So um, Kelly, we've got a few show and tells. We've got about 10 minutes left. So let's get some of those. Uh, what, what'd you bring us today? Um, what did I bring? Um, well, uh, it's the day after Valentine's Day. Look at these gorgeous roses. Ooh. So if you were to take your roses out of your water and you look here, you see all this stuff floating in it, right? Okay. So all that stuff floating in that water is going to grow bacteria. And that bacteria is going to slowly kill, not slowly, quickly kill these roses. So what I want you to do is, you know, someone you love got you these beautiful roses. I want you to change the water every day. Well, usually a little package of floral food comes with you. I usually use that one up right away and I need to make my own. So I'm going to use uh, one quart of warm water. I'm going to put one teaspoon of sugar, two teaspoons of lemon juice. Why lemon juice, Kelly? Because I am trying to lower the acidity of the water and it'll actually, the plant, the flowers will take it up. And one teaspoon of bleach. Yes, bleach. So I'm going to do that in warm water. The warm water is going to be taken up by the plant, uh, flowers faster, plus it's going to dissolve the sugar. So if you change the water daily and actually make this homemade recipe, you can add five, 10 days onto this arrangement. Otherwise, they're probably going to start dying here in three to four days. Another thing I do is recut the stems, just opening that stem back up so it'll take up that water. Great advice. So everybody can get some extra miles on their on their Valentine's flowers. Thank you, Kelly. All right, Jennifer, what do you have for us? I brought, uh, last one of the last times I was on, I had all these baby house plants. And so I've been slowly potting them up and this one, I don't know if it'll show up very well. This is called silver squill and mm. it's related to hyacinth of all things, but it's 
if you lived in a warmer part of the country, you might plant it out um, as a ground cover. But in Illinois, it's a house plant. It's one of those that is considered to be one of the more indestructible house plants. Although I can say I killed it as a new mom because I totally forgot about it for months on end and I killed it. Uh, but they um, they have kind of those. It's, it looks like a bulb at the base and that you can see there's little baby ones kind of coming out and that's how it will fill up this pot. But what I love about it is it has really pretty silver foliage and it's one of those house plants that you don't have to fight it to get it to bloom. It will bloom pretty much nonstop and it has a teeny tiny white flower so it's nothing huge but it's a flower in February. A flower. <laughs> so that's good. Um, and it, it can take a, a fair amount of neglect. I will say absolutely forgetting about it for six months was a bad idea, but you know, it's, it takes very little water. Um, it's one that you want to keep on the dry side um, and it will reward you with constant flowering. So it's, it's a winner in my book. It's also every part of it's poisonous. So if you have cats um, or kids or some that are going to be chewing on this, um, I would put it up out of their way. Cats or kids, right? We have to give that disclaimer, especially these days. Exactly. <laughs> okay, John, uh, you've always got interesting show and tells. Yeah, what I brought today was a bag of vermiculite. Okay. Had, last time we talked about um, seed starting uh, and how important it was to use the right uh, seed starting mix. And, you know, they, it actually says seed starting on it. And so you need to get that nice and moist and then lay out your, your seed starting in your trays and lay your seeds out and then cover it with that according to what the package says. But then they found out that if you put a, a, a thin layer of vermiculite over the top of that, it helps regulate the moisture and keeps the fungi from forming at the top where you get damping off in some of your new seedlings. So we're doing that at the greenhouse also. And I found that it does seem to help uh, substantially compared to just, and, and especially don't use garden soil. I, I know Kelly and Jennifer <laughs> know, they, they preach this all the time, but uh, I still see people that are just go out and dig up some soil and then they wonder why their, their plants fail. And, you know, they were looking good and the next morning they came out and they were looked like the, a little, uh, guy with an axe came and chopped them all down and they were all laying down dead. So uh, if you, and, and this is a big bag of vermiculite, it comes in very small. If you're just starting a few seeds, I would just recommend sprinkling it and uh, putting it over the top. And you'll find that you probably have a lot less disease and, and it also helps control the moisture uh, retaining of, uh, uh, of your uh, plants in, in the soil. Just make sure you have good good drainage in your pots. And those that are doing winter seeding, I know some people are getting into the milk jugs and, and different containers that they put the seed starting mix or, or just potting soil. I, I found out that potting soil actually is better if you're doing winter seeding. And it's taking like a milk jug, cutting it in half, putting your potting soil in and doing some of your hardier seeds and you cover it and you put, you take the lid off and put it outside. You tape it together and then you put it outside and you forget it until spring. And mm -hmm. it hardens those plants, you get healthier. Uh, things like uh, that, you don't wanna do tomatoes and peppers like that, but um, some of your coal crops and things like that. Uh, but this um, vermiculite really seems to, to uh, do a mm -hmm. trick as far as some of that. So Kelly, um, would you say it's more the weight of garden soil or potting soil? Why? You know, just for folks who are brand new learning, why do we need to get the seed starting mix versus what we have laying around or, or something like that? Because I want to be in full control. <laughs> because <laughs> <All right. laughs> what happens with garden soil, you know, um, when you get it wet, it just stays wet. And I mean, even though you never want seed to dry out too much, it cannot sit in water like that. And so I think garden soil just holds water a little bit more. And, um, you know, plus it has the clay in it that the roots don't really, you know, if you think about it, you look at the, 
a soilless media at a greenhouse and you just want to put your fingers in it, right? But the dirt in the backyard, it has a lot of clay in it. And so the roots don't really love to, to expand out in it. So uh, um, just that high quality soilless mix is better. I, I never skip on quality soil and fertilizer. I will buy the cheap plants at the box stores like that but never will I buy cheap soil and cheap fertilizer. I always go for the top quality. All right. And we're going to end it on that note. Great advice to live by. <laughs> you can go cheap on the plants, but certain things you just can't skimp no. on. I like that. All right, guys, thank you so much for your time and talent. We're going to definitely uh, keep in touch with you on the straw bale gardening. Um, I think that you know, last year we had so many folks outside for the first time gardening and now maybe a little bit more adventurous. So we, we, I want to follow this progression with both of you and hopefully get out and get some more uh, on the scene sort of shows done um, and really get into it this year and show people what to do and how to do it. So thank you so much for coming. Thanks for bringing uh, your show and tells and thank you for sending in your questions. And we will post more information about the Straw Bale Gardens on our Facebook. Um, you can find that information there and we will see you next time. Good night. <laughs>